Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Identifying and Addressing Health-Related Social Needs Through Primary Care Innovation and Managed Care, made possible by the Commonwealth Fund. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few logistics. To eliminate background noise, phone lines are being muted during today's event. There will be a moderated Q&A session following today's presentation. You may submit questions online anytime by clicking the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen. Today's event will be recorded. Slides and a video archive will be shared publicly on chcs.org. At the end of today's webinar, we ask that you please complete a brief evaluation that will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is very important to us. I will now turn the webinar over to Diana Crumley, Senior Program Officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Hello, and welcome to our webinar on identifying and addressing health-related social needs through primary care innovation and Medicaid managed care. So I'll start with uh, some opening remarks, welcome and introductions. And we have two great presentations on health-related social needs initiatives from the Hawaii Department of Human Services, MedQuest Division, and the Community Health Plan of Washington. We'll follow up with a Q&A after those presentations. Next slide. So I'm Diana Crumley, Senior Program Officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Over the past four years, I've worked with Medicaid managed care plans, state Medicaid agencies, and community-based organizations on issues relating to value-based payment, Medicaid managed care, and specifically health-related social needs and health equity. We have two great panelists, Judy Moore-Peterson, uh, Judy is a nationally recognized leader in healthcare delivery system reform and Medicaid. Prior to working as a state Medicaid director in Hawaii, she served as state Medicaid director in Oregon and was president of the board of the National Association of Medicaid Directors. We also have Kat FM Latte, Director health of Health System Innovation at the Community Health Plan of Washington. And that's a Medicaid managed care organization here in Washington. CAT works to ensure the plan is on the leading edge of health systems, innovation, and transformation, and is advancing health equity in the context of that work. She leads the plan's engagement and participation in major state-based reform efforts, including Washington's Medicaid transformation activities. She also manages system level efforts to address the social determinants of health, financing approaches, including value-based payment strategy and design and community-based programs. Thank you so much for joining us today. Next slide. So you may be new to the Center for Healthcare Strategies and if so, welcome. Um, we are a policy design and implementation partner dedicated to strengthening the US healthcare system to ensure better, more equitable outcomes, particularly for people served by Medicaid. Particularly relevant to our work on primary care innovation, we often provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to state Medicaid agencies and host learning collaboratives. So much of our work in this space is inspired by those state Medicaid agencies that we work very closely with. Next slide. This webinar is part of CHCS's Strengthening Primary Care Through Medicaid Managed Care series. The series is made possible by the Commonwealth Fund and examines tools and levers that states can use to advance comprehensive primary care. Often this is in the context of Medicaid managed care and those uh, purchasing levers uh, often associated with Medicaid managed care procurements and contracts. So be on the lookout for other upcoming webinars and new resources related to this topic. Next slide. Now, if you navigate to our CHCS website, it's very likely that you'll run into our toolkit for states on this subject. And that toolkit uh, is broken up into modules and has a number of implementation considerations, state examples, 
and sample managed care contract language. Next slide. Now I've said primary care innovation, comprehensive primary care, advanced primary care. You might be wondering what that means to us. And the answer is it usually has five components, promoting health equity, enhancing team-based care, using technology to improve access, integrating behavioral health care, and identifying and addressing social needs. There are also levers to drive uptake and spread, and those are those three bars across the bottom here. And you also may be wondering what these check marks mean. That means that there are some great resources available to you on our website. So you can download related presentations relating to team-based care and value-based payment, for example. And then we'll go into detail on identifying and addressing social needs today. So one of the modules for our toolkit is called Identifying and Addressing Social Needs that was published around 2019. And it heavily focuses on screening for social risk factors. So some design considerations that you will hear today and also see in that toolkit are questions like who should be screened, by whom, and at what level, for example, at the state level, the managed care plan level, or the primary care team. For what social risk factors, for example, housing or food insecurity? And why are you doing this, this screening? Toward what goal? States may also consider how screening results will be documented, for example, through the use of Z codes used to improve care, for example, in the creation of a care plan, or shared across healthcare systems or organizations, for example, a managed care plan sharing the results of a health risk assessment to a primary care provider. And finally, the module focuses on examples of how states are using their managed care contracts to advance this work and pulls out sample RFP language uh, in addition to sample contract language. Next slide. Another resource available for, to you, for you is this recent blog. And this blog was published uh, just a couple of weeks ago and really reflects on this point of time. And at this time, many states are thinking about how to put health equity front and center in their programs. So reflecting on this, I have four considerations for state Medicaid agencies. First of all, be precise with words and goals. Think about what's at the individual level, the community level, upstream, downstream. Also remember that achieving health equity will require much more than addressing unmet needs. For example, to address racial health equity or to achieve racial health equity, we must confront and dismantle systematic racism. So be careful not to conflate social determinants of health and health equity. Second, strive to be more democratic and less technocratic. Often when we confront this subject, we think, think about how to collect data, how to report data, how to use that data to um, improve our value-based payment models. But it's important not to forget about the people behind those data sets. Remember that health equity is a process and an outcome. So engage communities and co-design social needs interventions with communities that are, impact, that are impacted, especially um, communities that have been marginalized. And the last two elements, lead when you can, pay for what you want to see, those are related. And that's really focusing on the primary care perspective here. Primary care providers and teams likely contract with many different plans um, in both the Medicaid space and outside the Medicaid space. So states can consider ways to reduce unnecessary fragmentation as it relates to social care integration. For example, states can identify common tools and resources and identify sustainable funding structures to support whole person care. Now with that, I am going to turn it over to the lovely Judy Moore Peterson and she'll reflect more on some of um, those levers for state Medicaid agencies.
Thank you so much, Diana. I really appreciate that. Let's just go right ahead to the next slide, please. Um, so we've been working and talking about and uh, considering how to incorporate uh, social risk factors and social determinants of health or social drivers of health, if you prefer that language, um, for a number of years within uh, the state of Hawaii. Just a little bit about ourselves. We are uh, nearly 100% managed care, including our long-term supports and services. And so when we think about uh, incorporating social risk factors and social determinants of health into um, our program, it's largely through and via the, the health plans or the managed care uh, plans in our area. Um, and as Diana was outlining before, one of the interesting things about uh, this this work, and one of, one of the interesting things about us versus in, and the, um, uh, CHCS is how much our, our goals are really aligned. So um, ultimately we're looking at what do we need to do and what can we do as a Medicaid agency to help promote healthy families and healthy communities. And I incorporated this slide because, you know, we're as we're thinking about it, we're thinking about taking a whole person health perspective, and this is the integration of behavioral health a whole family uh, approach, which is thinking about not just the individual, but also the, um, the connections and the family and the community that's, uh, that's uh, sur surrounding them. And we have a particular focus on young children and their families. And this is also where we're thinking about investing in primary care as well. And these are all inter interlinked. And then um, we also want to think about that family in the context of their, of their community. Um, addressing health equity and addressing disparities is certainly part of that. And then paying attention to where it is that we live, work, play, and learn. Um, as you can tell from this, from this, it's it's right in line with exactly what this topic is today. So these social determinants of health or social drivers of health are really are really key, um, undergirding this entire um, uh, concept concept and uh, our entire strategic initiatives and where it is that we're going. Thank you, next slide. So as we're thinking, and just click on the next button, please. It's animated, there you go. So as we're thinking about the integration of social care into the delivery of the uh, healthcare system, you know, as Diana was mentioning, you can focus on individuals and you can focus on communities. And how we're starting to our work is actually focused more on the individual level. And then uh, in our phase two and phase three and ongoing uh, will be more directed towards um, taking a more of a community approach. And as you're thinking about um, on the individual level, you can either first it's getting in an awareness of what those social risk factors are and then figuring out, do I change my healthcare um, for, to adjust to the, the needs of that individual, or am I addressing and assisting with that, the needs of that uh, social, of that individual in addressing whatever uh, social need that, that they might have? Next slide, please. So as a, to drill down on that concept a little bit more, first, there's gaining an awareness, and this is where you're, you might be doing your screening, or trying to figure that those aspects about it of, of that person, and then uh, and then if you're making an adjustment, you're using that social risk factor to help change or address clinical decision making. So that's those three steps there that that are right there. Next slide, please. If you're providing assistance, then what you're doing is thinking about you're doing your your awareness, your screening, and then you're going to be linking those that those individuals to additional resources to help address, address their, their social needs. Next slide, please. So what, what, what we are doing um, in our state is we're addressing two things. We're addressing food insecurity and homelessness. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but this is an example of you know, thinking about how, how these concepts play out for an individual who might be facing food insecurity or homelessness. 
uh, whether you're providing, it's a, first of all, you're doing your screening. I'm gonna screen the patients for the, or the person for their food insecurity, um, letting the clinician know about the results if I'm uh, gonna be focusing on that. And then if I'm going to change a clinical perspective based on this, then I would think about, okay, what medications should I change or how might I need to address this or think through this if I'm prescribing medications that need to be taken with food or in providing assistance, well, how can I help them uh, um, learn where there might be or how they can enroll in SNAP, where there might be some um, uh, food banks, et cetera, that they could be able to get um, some, some healthy foods. Homelessness is the same similar thing. You're screening the person for, for housing insecurity or, or houselessness. Um, if again, with the prescribing medications, I might have to think about that. If I have medications that require refrigeration, then how, how, do, we, how do we adjust that clinical perspective? And then referring pa uh, patients to either shelters or helping with, with housing and applying for, for housing, et cetera. So next slide, please. So within, um, within our program, within uh, Hawaii's program, we are we we just recently completed a, a procurement for uh, we procured our managed care plans, and we built out and built up a lot having to do with uh, social determinants of health. We incorporated um, a social determinants of health transformation plan. I know that was a lot, and we have it at two different levels. One is we have one at the statewide level, and which and we're requiring the health plans to work with us on that statewide level, and that's one that we're taking a, a leadership role on, where we would be uh, uh, building and reaching out to various different stakeholders, community organizations, legislators, et cetera. And um, in this process, we're also gonna be building, and we are building on already existing efforts within this area. We have an accountable communities of health, through the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that one of the um, national plans got here for, for the state or for, for the, um, in Oahu, they're piloting it here. The community health centers have been quite engaged in this and they've used a tool called Prepare. And now a couple of them are also engaged in this accountable co communities of health pilot that's going on. And then we also have um, on deck a, a Within the for the hospitals, we also have a pay for performance effort around social determinants of health as well. So uh, we are also requiring our health plans to develop individualized work plans uh, that should be aligned with the statewide plan. It will be part of their quality assurance and performance improvement plan that all health plans are required to do. Um, and then uh, we'll be asking in that health in that work plan. They need to be thinking about the collection of that of that of that data and that information uh, that through uh, member level uh, screening. We do have some screening tools already that we've identified um, to to use, and some screening questions. As I noted earlier, we'll be focusing on um, uh, housing or housing insecurity as well as food insecurity. As part of this building on existing efforts, one of the things that we learned through the Accountable Communities of Health effort is that food insecurity was the number one um, social risk factor that uh, our members are facing. So uh, those that's, and then um, houselessness is, uh, we have the highest per capita of, of homelessness or houselessness in the, in the, in the nation, or at least we, we did. And so um, those two ha risen, have risen to the top as to why we're gonna focus on those two first. So um, we are working on then the, the screening tools. We've identified some screening tools and some screening questions that we want them to use, the managed care plans to use. We want them to uh, use the ICD-10 uh, Z codes and promote those. Uh, we want to have them increase provider understanding and then incorporate the SDOH strategies, et cetera. And then uh, here's this, that assistance with their social risk factor. We want them to link the beneficiaries to the SDOH needs. And then uh, 
developing some closed loop referral systems as well. Next, next slide. Um, so I already covered this uh, quite a, uh, a bit here, um, but this is, we, we are actually, not only are we gonna be focusing on the food insecurity and housing insecurity and homelessness, but we're also going to be starting with a targeted group for members with special health care needs. We did that because we wanted to sort of build up on this uh, on uh, within the first phase and get some experience and some, um, some work in that before we put it out uh, uh, broadly and widely. Again, they have to use the state approved screening questions. We have them already. And then if they wanna deviate, we have to work with them. Uh, we, uh, they are to share that managed care plans are to do the screening and then they're to share that information with the primary care providers so that they can inform clinical decision making. Uh, and then uh, eventually we want the managed care plans to actually delegate that screening to other and other court care coordination to more closer to the point of care uh, to the actual primary care provider of that or that team. Next slide, please. So we, um, as we've been thinking and talking to primary care providers, some say, hey, we don't have the time and resources to screen for it. And so uh, that's why another reason why we're having the managed care plans sort of work on this and then work on that on some of the closed loop referral systems, et cetera. But others, uh, particularly with the community health centers, they've already started doing the screening and this uh, also allows them to continue that role. Uh, these screening interventions are focused on addressing that whole person health uh, perspective uh, and then addressing, um, adjusting the clinical decisions as well as assisting with those uh, social needs for this high need, high cost population, people with very complex health needs next or, or social needs. Next slide, thank you. Um, so we have lots of things that we have to continue to figure out because uh, one of the things that we've definitely heard is from the physicians is, hey, we're not social workers. We don't know how to address these social needs. Um, and quite frankly, I don't want the physicians to be uh, spending their time trying to address their social needs. So it's, it's creating those connections with uh, community-based organizations, with that closed loop referral system? How is it that the physicians or the clinics or the clinicians or that team, how do they know that those, those are being uh, dealt with, et cetera? Part of it will be able to build on some of those pilots that we have, but nonetheless, it's still um, an issue that is gonna require a lot of work and a lot of attention. There's actually a lot of platforms and IT systems and, and uh, companies and vendors that are emerging that that are uh, billing themselves as being able to capture this information, track the health related social need, uh, loop in the community based organizations. And so now we're having to think through, we went from like nobody to like many, and then that can lead to some fragmentation and some challenges as well. Uh, the closed loop referral systems are a goal. Um, they're only developed for a couple of different areas and there's still some gaps, et cetera, that we have to definitely work on. Um, the screening questions that we might use in future phases to address other health-related social needs, we still have to work on those, come to agreement, um, and then adapt and adopt to meet some of Hawaii's needs. Um, some of it has to do with the things that might seem silly, but <laughs> like, the word for, for bed bugs here is not, or, um, or head lice, it's not, uh, it's not that, it's like bukus. And so people don't know what that is unless you ask appropriately. Um, or if you ask about, do you have bugs in your home? Well, everybody has bugs in their home because we live in the tropics. So uh, we are still working through a lot of those kinds of things. And then uh, how do you capture this information, either the coding, EHRs, how do you have the workflow to screen and then refer? Again, it's tied a little bit in, in with the, some of those other, other bullets. And then as Diana was noting, how and when and what health-related social needs are you actually going to pay for? 
We have a waiver in which we can pay for some housing related and tenancy support services, but we don't have waivers in many other areas in which um, we would also want to uh, pay for those, but we don't, we, we can't because we're the Medicaid agency and that's just like not going to be feasible and not possible. Also, we actually requested to pay for some additional housing related services and then um, and CMS told us no. So knowing that, it's like, well, how it's, it is a social related um, uh, health need, but how do you, how do you get that support? Um, and how do you create the, um, expand the community-based organizations, their capacity to be able to address these needs once we start doing the screening, et cetera. Next slide, please. All right, this is, I, I am not doing this. I just included this as a resource in case people were interested in what we had, had developed thus far regarding both the, the um, screening questions, the procedure codes that we're, we're looking at using, as well as the diagnosis codes when there is a positive screen. So this is, the, this is that information that uh, is included just for your information. Next slide, please. And if you anybody does have questions about anything we covered here or something that we didn't cover or I didn't do a drill down on, et cetera, these are the, uh, it's myself as well as my the two team who I have to thank greatly for helping to put this all this together, which is Ranjini Starr and Joy Suarez. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Judy. That was a great foray into the, the life of a, a state Medicaid agency dealing with these issues and, and trying to make headway. Um, next, uh, we have the perspective of a Medicaid managed care organization, essentially um, trying to advance this work forward and what they're doing um, in the context of, of primary care specifically. So Kat, FM Latte, take it over. Great, you can go to the next slide. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Judy. Uh, great to hold space with you uh, in this area. Uh, we used to interface in Oregon, so exciting to, to see her again. Um, so we can go to the next slide. I just wanted to pause, and uh, we at CHPW at Community Health Plan of Washington really are centering whole person care and health equity and um, really pause and give thanks to the people whose land I'm on, uh, which is the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish. And the reason why I'm doing this in this setting is that as we think about health-related social supports and social needs, I think it's important to understand the stories of the land that we are on, as those stories can often really drive um, what individuals need and, and why they need it. Um, so really I encourage others to explore uh, this link right here to understand the whose land you are on. Next slide. Who's CHPW? So Community Health Plan of Washington, we were founded in 1992 by community health centers to really be a health plan that could work for community health centers uh, and the individuals that they serve. We find ourselves in that same space is really rooted in social justice. Uh, and really wanting to advance, uh, advance those causes um, as we pursue whole person care. Uh, we are also rooted in Washington state. Uh, this is the state that we serve and we really uh, find that really critically important. Uh, the really focusing on the whole health of our members and their families and the community that really spoke to me in, in Judy's slide um, and really thinking about that. And additionally, uh, really just thinking about uh, who our staff and board are, are local. They're part of the fabric of the community um, in which we serve. And I think that's really critically important um, as we are walking through and really engaging with individuals on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and both again sort of within our staff and our board. Uh, next slide, please. So who do we serve? Uh, we, we really started out within the Medicaid managed care space or the only not-for-profit Medicaid managed care plan um, at this time. And, but really look at our, um, who we serve as how can we be a, a 
offer, offering coverage across the care and life continuum. And so really expanded into Medicare Advantage. Um, and also uh, recently Washington State expanded a, a public option uh, within the exchange and uh, Community Health Plan of Washington, Community Health Network of Washington really saw this as an opportunity to partner with the state and continue to consider ways in which we could push towards more affordable coverage uh, for more individuals within the state of Washington. Next slide, please. So this is the slide to sort of start off with. So coming at it from a Medicaid managed care perspective, really thinking through how do we pay for whole person care? How do we drive towards that? And so I wanted to start off with really our, our dominant model that we have leveraged and built over time and really learned along the way to try to shift it to drive towards the goals that we're seeing again and really centering whole person care and health equity. What I will say is that we've been working on this model with community health centers uh, since 2007. And uh, along that pathway, also wanted to note some of the actions that have happened at the state level that have driven some of this work forward um, and thinking about uh, the transition that Washington made to integrated managed care uh, and really bringing an um, uh, integrating whole, uh, physical health and behavioral health. And also thinking about uh, really pursuing value-based payment. And so bringing forward expectations within uh, managed care contracts within the state of Washington to align around specific measures and also have an expectation of the amount of payment and individuals that would be covered by models that really sit, if folks are aware of the Healthcare Payment and Learning Action Network model, uh, from two seat uh, all the way into category four. So really thinking about some of those pieces that the, that the state has been pushing on, um, really thinking, okay, so how, how do we start to grow and build our models to really um, meet some of those expectations while also meeting the expectations and really partnering with providers in that space. So our dominant model that we have, we have about 77% um, of our Medicaid members covered within uh, this model uh, is total cost of care model that's inclusive of primary care, hospital, specialty, pharmacy, and behavioral health. It sits in that 3B category as an upside downside shared savings model. Um, we, in that space, tie the performance um, to uh, tie performance and the, the really benefit of the savings or uh, the reduction of the deficit that has to be paid back to the performance of on 13 quality measures. Those 13 quality measures, as I noted, are really aligned with those measures that the state mm -hmm. is putting forward within our contract. Um, and so we do see some evolution of those measures over time as those measures that we have from the state also evolve. Uh, we also pull forward CAPS measures, uh, really thinking about um, that insight as well. And then there's also some specific measures that Washington has developed around uh, penetration of both uh, mental health and substance use disorder uh, to really try to move toward that space of how, you know, how are we measuring the integration. Um, and then one thing that I will focus on within this conversation in the next couple slides uh, is this idea of how we think about sub-payment methodologies underneath the overarching payment methodology and how within that space we're really linking it to strategic initiative programs to really push towards some of our shared goals. But before I go there, just wanting to talk a little bit uh, about, we also partner the model uh, with a lot of access to technical support. Uh, we have a population health management platform that integrates claim and clinical data. And we'll talk a little bit about how some of that intersects with some of the work that we've done around identifying social needs uh, in a couple of the next slides. Additionally, we have dedicated practice coaching and support and peer learning opportunities. So really trying to leverage uh, both, we have the practice coaches that are assigned out to specific uh, community health centers across the state so that they really have that point of contact. And then also creating uh, forums for individuals to learn together and share uh, what they're facing, what they're struggling with and how they might be able to you know, work on that collectively. And then what we've seen with the model is we have seen an uh, increased community investment and in partnerships as we look at that sort of overarching space of really 
tying in the expectation and responsibility of these of primary care hospitals, specialty behavioral health, really seeing that drive community partnership, um, but also uh, after the fact, so as they're starting to see the savings come forward, if they're performing well within the model, seeing increased investment within the community, we've seen uh, housing be built, we've seen expansion of specific clinical services, um, as well as partnerships that have resulted in the creation of a harm reduction center as well, just to name a few. So we can go on to the next slide. And as I noted, uh, one of the areas that we have tried to build out is thinking about, again, the overarching model being that 3B shared savings space, but underneath it, what are sub payment methodologies that you could use to really drive forward in key strategies that you want to achieve? Um, and so two that I'm gonna focus on, uh, one is around the social determinant of health and social need identification support and program development. And then the other one is an equity learning collaborative that we're in the midst of right now. So next slide. So, uh, a little while back, uh, we as an organization, uh, again, in thinking about how are we going to as an organization and support our providers in addressing the social needs that are coming forward, uh, again, a lot of alignment with some of the slides that Judy put forward is that recognition of how do we work towards appropriate identification of what those social needs are. And so we did carry out a survey um, with our community health centers and some of the results I have here on the slide. Um, so just, you know, not alignment across uh, both the tool that's being used or even a standard tool that was being used um, in the first place, uh, that there was identified uh, sort of elevation of need for support around the collection of that data and how to document it within the EHR. And then also um, thinking through the other component uh, that was brought forward is just not using the identification of social needs to actually design programs that, that the providers were building out. So potentially designing programs that may not be meeting the needs that individuals were really facing. So through the uh, initiative, we uh, moved to fund uh, specific projects that were brought forward by the community health centers. There's 20 community health centers across the community health network of Washington, and many of them are very diverse um, in serving different parts of the state and so sort of elevating what was it that they, uh, that they wanted to focus on. And so uh, here on the slide, we noted some of the projects that uh, came forward that we worked on with the CHCs. And again, in this space also combined it again with that idea of a learning collaborative and forums together to share. So really thinking about training on workflow integration of assessment tools. Um, we did find that a number of the CHCs were using the prepare tool. Um, other tools that were noted uh, were the Accountable Health Communities screening tool uh, from the CMMI program, Health Leads, and then the Patient Reported Outcomes Quality of Life tool. So those were sort of the common tools that were brought forward. Uh, additionally, looking at strategies for completing patient assessments, both identifying the patient populations um, initially that should be assessed, but also working through strategies with staff to appropriately ask questions and think about what might be coming forward related to when those questions are asked, how might that be elevating or re-traumatizing individuals? And so ensuring that staff that are asking those questions have some of that support and awareness um, of how to, to engage in that space appropriately. Additionally, uh, really building and coding education uh, around Z codes, uh, in that space, and then considering how do you expand assessments to all patient populations. So the next couple of slides are just going to show some things that sort of came out of that work. So in looking at the alignment across the prepare uh, tool, really seeing um, the way in which that could be built to be built in and then move to the identification of the Z codes. And something that I wanted to note as well that really helped us Sort of amplify and push this work forward with uh, the community health centers was in 2017, the state of Washington did move forward and in, in incorporating the Z59 uh, code 
uh, into the risk scoring process. And so that really um, helped us incentivize uh, the providers in moving towards a space to really uh, ramp up how individuals could bring, bring that code um, more so into, into their work. Next slide. The next slides start to shift. So as we are working with our community health centers, we of course were working ourselves around how do we start to build out some of the capacity and bring forward the information that we have. And it was really from a number of different spaces. And so this slide is just a picture snapshot of from our health risk assessment, um, what were identified as individuals uh, unmet social needs at this point in time. And you can see a pretty high level employment, housing and transportation uh, coming forward. So that's an HRA uh, data that's coming forward. I think another space, and I'll share this on the next slide, but something else I wanted to note is also engagement and utilization of the enrollment file. And the enrollment file having specific indicators that could also be pulled forward into data. And so thinking through some individuals indicate that they are unhoused in that, uh, in that enrollment file. And some may use an address that is reflective of uh, a shelter space. And so uh, doing some run-throughs of that enrollment data with some of those um, specific uh, residencies, having a better indication of sort of understanding when an individual might be unstably housed. Additionally, within the state of Washington, we have a foundational community supports benefit, which is supportive housing and supported employment. Um, and within that space, there's an opportunity to bring forward uh, some of that information as well. So we can go on to the next slide. So this is just also sort of just an, an image of some of the other data that we've been bringing forward. So we've got Z-Code data. Jiva is our care management platform. So bringing forward some of that data coming out of care planning. And then we also have entered into a relationship with Unitas. Um, as Judy was mentioning, that idea of the closed loop referral um, opportunity as, as something that is really beneficial. And so that's something that we've been using as an organization and are working with both providers and community partners to really try to build out the capacity of that network. Next slide. Uh, so then the, this slide is really just to reinforce some of what Diana has shared and some of what, um, what Judy brought forward. It's just that sort of recognition is that we have to do this in a systematic, a systemic way and really thinking about sort of a public health approach to uh, you know, system, community, and then individual. How are we moving that work forward? And so this slide is just to sort of indicate some of that work that we've been doing uh, to have it be mutually reinforcing, um, but just that recognition that we can turn on a hamster wheel to try to address individual social needs. But if we don't go upstream and think collectively and together, about the systems change that we need, then we're not maybe gonna get very far. So the next uh, slide, I'm gonna move through this, is a program that I wanted to highlight um, as also Diana called forward, is just that sort of pausing and reflecting that so many of the social needs that we, that we see are really driven by a lack of access to power, money, and resources. And recognizing that much of that access has been determined or has been, the barriers have been created to that because of systemic racism and oppression. And so thinking through the way in which we design programs through an equity lens to address social needs is really critical. And so most recently we worked on an initiative to try to bring funding uh, to the CHCs to have them focus on addressing a specific disparity um, but really thinking about how they're doing that. And many of those programs have led to programs that are addressing social needs, um, but wanting to think uh, about what are those processes that need to go into place to build out the design of that program. So as we think about the application process that we moved through for this specific program, we really thought about how our individuals, dis or how the CHC disaggregating data and really looking into the data, both about what's there but also what's not there, um, because we know that we have data that's incomplete and we know that some of that data is being captured in a way that might not allow 
people to fully answer the questions about, um, about who they are. Um, considering root cause analysis uh, in the design of those programs, so as we might see, those root cause analyses may actually elevate um, a lot of social needs that are coming forward that are leading to increased disparities as well. And really inclusion, inclusion of individuals in the design, uh, development, implementation, and evaluation of the program. So really coming back to that space of engaging those most impacted by the work in the work and how we can do that well. So next slide. Just wanted to give folks a window. We're, we're really in the first year of this program, um, but now we're looking out to year two. And I think what we are envisioning is really doing, allowing the CHC, supporting the CHCs and continuing some of those programs, but really continuing to elevate and center around some of these equity capacities or infrastructure that we've identified as really key because we just see that it, we just don't believe that social programs to address social needs um, can be developed without embedding equity uh, throughout that program development. The next slide is um, highlights just a couple of the programs that some of the community health centers have been working on underneath this program. Um, and you can see again, sort of specifically, uh, some of where they're really using oppor opportunities to address individual social needs. And then the last slide that I have is some just reflections and considerations that we've been thinking through uh, in this idea of how do we progress both along uh, moving forward and how we address uh, social needs and social determinants of health or social, social drivers of health and thinking about how you embed equity into that work. And um, so I think just again, that idea of sort of what's that capacity investment that's needed um, underneath a more advanced payment arrangement as well. And then considering what we're measuring, we oftentimes focus on what we already can measure. So how do we push ourselves a little bit further um, in that space? And then uh, making sure that we're not only just addressing the social needs, but that we're also thinking about the systems that created those needs to begin with. And um, really thinking about the power that we have uh, and ensuring that we're really engaging those most impacted in the work. Uh, and then just shout out to how we partner with our state Medicaid agencies as well. Um, it'll be key to have that partnership to really move this work forward collectively. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll end. Well, thank you so much to you both for your presentations. And we have a lot of questions from the audience and a lot of them um, certainly are reminiscent of things that states have asked in the past um, in the context of our learning collaboratives. And I wanna start on this theme of, you know, uh, potentially duplicating screenings. I know some states worry that um, perhaps having multiple screenings will overwhelm or re-traumatize um, enrollees. How do you ensure that uh, patients or members do not receive duplicate or even more screenings? And, and what is the role of partnerships here? And we can start with Judy. Thank you. And uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of a complicated question uh, in that we we are actually um, we're more concerned about people not being screened as opposed to receiving duplicate screens. And I think uh, I think that's part part of one of the or part of the reason that we're looking for these uh, uh, broader tools that help you identify and track. Uh, so health related uh, social needs is to make sure that, for example, if you have already identified somebody as, as being um, houseless, that that you're able to track, okay, where are you in that process? And that it's that information is shared amongst the whole care team, not just the managed care plan, but also the, the primary care provider, the, the hospital, et cetera, through, through the, a shared EHR, through a shared um, pl platform. But if you're thinking about, like, for example, if you think when when um, the Academy of Communities of Health pilot that's going on right here, 
they do ask, um, they, you know, they have a, you know, little iPads for people to, to answer their screening questions when they first come into the office. So it's not uh, an actual provider who's doing the, uh, necessarily who's doing the one-on-one, -on -one, but it can be done while they're waiting for their appointment. That person will be asked each time they come in to, you know, it's like, would you like to fill in this, um, and it's voluntary, would you like to fill in this, the, these screenings, these screening questions at the very beginning? So I think um, that's why it's complicated because on the one hand, you don't want to, you know, have them asked in the, in the foyer and then they turn right around and ask again, and then they go to a different provider and they ask again. So you wanna make sure that same day, you're not asking multiple questions and that there's an awareness, a general awareness about what those results are. But you also, people's situations change. And so you do want to give the opportunity to, uh, for people to update that information. And as part of that screening, they're also being asked when they, as part of that closed loop referral system, they're also being asked, would you like assistance with these today? And then, um, and then, yeah, it's a, so then it's, that, that is how that closed loop referral system works and whether they follow up or not. I think kind of echoing Judy's point, it's, it is complicated. Um, and it's sort of like, how can we design the system to rule them all? Like the, like the ring um, for Lord of the Rings. It's just that idea of we haven't, created some of that interoperability that I think would be so beneficial and actually help support some of that. So, you know, what we have tried to do is some of the data that uh, flows through the population health management software that we support our community health centers with can pull forward some of what's coming through in the HRA and some of what's coming through and, you know, in some of that data that we are collecting. But that is not then meeting the expectation necessarily of the community partner that also might be interfacing with the in, in individual as well. And so um, I think there's there's some great uh, things that are being tested out there related to shared care planning um, across different systems as well. And so I think I'm just really looking forward to seeing how that can come forward. Thank you so much for that. And here's another question that often comes up in the context of this work. Um, I think there are varying opinions on the use of, of Z codes. Um, and I, I think I recall, Kat, um, you re referenced Z codes. And Judy, um, you also uh, talked about that uh, potential SUH work plan um, where a collection of Z codes or reporting of Z codes was an uh, issue. Can you share any lessons learned? on provider uptake of, of billing for Z codes and strategies for increasing the use of those codes? Since we're still in the planning process, no. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I do know that there's, that uh, yeah, it's actually a struggle to get, get providers to start to use Z codes. It, they're new, et cetera. Uh, but for us, they're, they're, they actually are really key um, and, we're hoping, we're, we, we are hoping that they, there is an expansion and in, in the use of the Z codes uh, because other ways to collect that information is, 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 is actually quite limited. Hey, Judy, um, can you folks hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, well, I okay. mean, <laughs> so. And Rashini, um, introduce yourself so everyone knows um, sure. who you are. Yeah, and I apologize, my video won't work, but um, I'm Ranjani Starr, the health analytics administrator for the MedQuest division. So um, I just wanted to add a little bit about Z codes. And that is that, um, uh, and, and someone else had asked a question about the hospital pay for performance program as well, and sort of how we've done this. But um, because um, STOH data collection is both new as well as so critical to then having that data become part of our administrative data and part of our claims. Um, we, we have set up the pay for performance program um, in, in sort of phases and currently it's more like a pay for infrastructure um, measure where we are essentially supporting the hospitals and setting up their systems, not only to collect the data in their EHR, 
but also then to have it translated into the appropriate procedure codes and Z codes per sort of our specification so that as the use of, as they implement and they start to use the um, screeners that we'll start to see evidence of that both in terms of the fact that the screening was done through the procedure code and any instances of a positive screen through the Z codes that we, we've, we've kind of set up the pay for performance program to build the infrastructure in a way that'll sort of automatically translate to data. So hopefully that helps. Kat, do you wanna add anything from your perspective? I think the only quick thing is I was shaking my head um, in agreement of just that idea of, um, well, one, there's just been a lot of training uh, around this work. So just continuous ongoing training and support and that sort of workflow management. And then how you can create the ease of the system that once something is collected and input, that it feeds other places. So just that slide that I had where it was sort of how you leverage the prepare tool to then inform and have it then code to the Z codes. And you know, I just think that ability to have things to talk to one another so you're not missing then pieces um, that come through is just really important. The training, 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 and support. Diana, I would also add that um, because we specified the questions and answers, we were also able to provide the algorithm for, depending upon what answers are provided to these questions, how they should translate the Z code. So um, Judy kind of presented that crosswalk of here are the questions, here are the answer choices, and then given what answer choices are selected by a member, would that result in a Z code or not for different instances? So we provide a lot of that information up front so that the translation into the Z code is also a pretty standardized process as opposed to sort of a um, individual or subjective kind of decision. But we're still at the very beginning stages of this whole thing. So how it's like it's still in the as, as Ranjini was noting, we're still in the the building, the building of the infrastructure and the capacity phase. But that is a and um, and um, as you as you can tell, Ranjini and, and Joy, who are part of my team, they're they're um, happy to share additional information down into nitty gritty details uh, that we have, um, noting that we still have a lot more to, to do and a lot more work to do in this area. Kat, you noted the need for training, training, training. And I'm wondering if you've taken any steps to encourage a trauma-informed approach or other training techniques um, for providers doing uh, the screening. That's something that we, I have to pull forward the training um, approaches. It's something that we've done overall um, with respect to the work with our, with our provider, providers as well as with our staff. Um, and I think it's the recognition, so it's been brought forward, um, but related to specifically in the training and work plans to build out the identification and use of um, tools for social needs and social supports. I would have to directly get back to you, but in a broad sense, we have really been trying to promote those topics within overall provider training, as well as training with our organization, um, so that that's embedded as they may be engaging in, these, um, in this specific work. Well, I looked down and the time really flew by. I, I just wanna thank you, um, say a thank you to both of our panelists today. We really appreciate your time and expertise. Uh, the slides and the recording from today's event will be posted on chcs.org. Um, and in addition, if you attended this webinar, uh, we'll send you an email um, with, with that information as well. But thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and do keep in touch. Have a good one. Aloha.